Hi, my name's Priya, and we'll be talking about social cognitive theory for the next couple of minutes. So just to give you a brief outline, I'll be covering uh, what the theory is and its origins. Then I'll move on to assumptions, then factors that influence social cognitive theory, and finally, application in the classroom. So what exactly is social cognitive theory? Well, it began in the 1960s with Albert Bandura, and he sort of combined three different uh, theories or factors that contribute towards this new one. Uh, so behaviorism, how we behave, cognitive psychology, so what goes on inside the mind, and sometimes environmental factors will play a big role in how we learn according to this theory. So the theory itself focuses on learning through observation. So what we see, we try to imitate or not imitate depending on the circumstances. And the conclusion is that other people have some control over our own behavior. The theory is also known as social learning theory sometimes uh, in some of the research that I found. So some of the basic assumptions in this theory are that people can learn by observing others. So we don't necessarily have to uh, work through trial and error and make a decision based on that. Sometimes just observing how others react and the, the results, the consequences from their uh, result behavior is enough for us to learn. Uh, learning also doesn't always have to result in behavioral changes, so sometimes just processing the information is enough. We don't necessarily have to act on our behavior. Behavior is directed towards goals, so that gives us something to a work towards, and that drives our uh, behavior. A behavior will eventually become self-regulated, so depending on the response that we get, it, can, it becomes a natural uh, response from us. And finally, reinforcement and punishment have indirect effects on learning and behavior. So we're going to look at those two a little more closely in the next couple minutes because it does play a major role in this theory. So some of the factors that influence social cognitive theory are expectations. So when a response is reinforced every time, it becomes an expectation. So it becomes a habit. Reinforcement increases the frequency of behavior only when students think or know that the behavior is being reinforced. So for example, as a teacher, when you're assigning grades, be clear on what it is that you're reinforcing by explaining it. Uh, unless the students know what it is, they can't uh, act work towards that goal. So explain why a student got an A if you want to see that same pattern of behavior in the next assignment. Another factor is vicarious experiences. So this can either have a positive or negative effect on our behavior. Reinforcement increases frequency of observed behavior. So um, when we see someone being uh, rewarded, we will most likely repeat that behavior. And it, in the opposite end, if we see someone being punished, uh, we're less likely to repeat that behavior. And the vicarious experiences is great because it's it, it uh, highlights the fact that we don't have to always uh, work towards trial and error. We could sometimes just look at others. The th last factor that influences social cognitive theory, uh, I think this is the most important one, is modeling. So people learn through observation in real time with real people. So uh, directly, like what you see in a classroom, as opposed to watching a video about something. Um, it can be through live models or symbolic models. Uh, again, live models is just real people in real time. So some characteristics of effective models, uh, the model should demonstrate competence. So know, they should know what they're actually doing and that should come across to the person observing them. Uh, they can have prestige or power. This doesn't necessarily mean power as in like the prime minister of Canada. It could be someone more local or more applicable to the situation, such as uh, teachers. Uh, usually, some well, what the study one study found is that effective models are usually uh, the same sex or gender as uh, the person trying to model them. So we see that often when 
little girls will imitate their big sisters or vice versa. Um, we associate better with people who are like us. And that brings me to the next point is that behavior relevant to one's situ own situation. So again, uh, we tend to identify with people who look like us or um, resemble us in greater ways. So the, an example would be um, Asian students looking up to Asian teachers as opposed to uh, their other teachers because there is a closer uh, relationship naturally just because of similar uh, background. So also, uh, some conditions are necessary for students to model someone. And the first being attention. So you need to listen uh, before you attempt a, a skill or behavior. So if you ask your students to use a microscope in the science class, first they need to listen to the instructions before they can actually start using it. Retention. Um, that could either be through you know memory or some kind of aids. Uh, to give them instructions and procedures to follow. They will then practice motor reproduction, so they will imitate or practice the behavior or skill. And in this case, the teacher will sort of intervene with feedback or guidance to help guide the student and to help them make necessary changes in order to effectively uh, model the behavior, such as if they're look, holding the microscope uh, with the, uh, they're holding it wrong and it's affecting the performance, the teacher might come in and correct that. And finally, like all things, there needs to be some level of motivation uh, for students to actually want to complete the modeling. Uh, some final points. So students are more likely to pay attention and process info effectively when they believe they'll be reinforced for learning it. So again, make it clear to your students always from the get-go what it is you're reinforcing and that they will be uh, reinforced. Some students may not show their learning unless they think there will be reinforcement. So again, same thing as before. And the non-occurrence of expected reinforcement sort of acts as a punishment. So once it's become an expectation, try to follow through with it. So now we'll be looking at uh, application in the classroom with uh, an example. So something we've all dealt with in our classes, in our practice, is cell phones. Uh, it's, sometimes it's a big issue. Um, and if people are learning by observing others, uh, some ways to sort of highlight the main points of this theory are, uh, or that is that you have to point out when behavior is appropriate as a way to promote it or encourage it and reinforce it. So let's say you have a student who came to class and immediately put their cell phone away. So you could uh, use them as an example to promote that same behavior by calling them out, uh, thanking them for putting away their cell phone, and that way other students might modeling, start modeling that behavior. Um, so when the opposite happens, when people are demonstrating negative uh, behavior such as they have their cell phone out, it's important that you show punishment or discouragement the first time around. Because if not, uh, once once student gets away with it, we know that others will start pulling out their cell phones as well and start imitating that behavior. So the first time around, just point it out uh, that they will their what your punishment is is exactly. And obviously, as uh, the teacher, you are a role model and uh, students will imitate your behavior. So if you have your cell phone out, they're more likely to use it themselves. So model what you want to see. So again, teacher, you are, as the teacher, you are the main role model in the classroom, classroom. Therefore, you should always exhibit behaviors you want to see in your students. So you want them to do as you say, not uh, do as you do rather. Uh, not just as you say. So again, make sure to uh, explain what it is you're reinforcing from the get-go and always reinforce behaviors you wish to see uh, again in your students. Uh, classmates can also be models. So pair up students when you think there is a behavior or a skill that can be learned from each other. Um, so maybe stronger students with weaker students so they could model the behavior and through observation and try to imitate that themselves and again special needs students could also be included this in this because they are developing their social skills and looking up to uh, their peers not just the teacher as the model 
So that's it for this con presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope I answered all your questions. Thank you.